How's it going, everybody? Welcome into another episode of Debate Night. We are back once again with another episode. Um, we got one new face today, some familiar faces returning to the show. We're going to talk all about what's going on in the world of disc golf, some things that have happened recently, some, some fan-submitted topics. And uh, yeah, we're just going to cover everything we got. So uh, let's introduce who we'll be debating tonight. First, we've got Brody Smith. Yeah, two things here to start. Uh, first one, uh, I look forward to seeing what clickbait title you guys come up with this week. Um, and then the second one, this is coming from potentially the most popular comment from last week's episode. Again, man of the people. I mm -hmm. read the comments. I listen to the comments. I'm a fan of the comments. This is from the hub Turk. He says, Brody, it wasn't about you being mean or rebutting too much. The rebuttals are part of the debate. It was about talking over the other analysts and taking up some of their time and derailing their responses. We Ooh. welcome the debate and the disagreement. Just keep it to the rebuttal and not during someone else's time. <laughs> rebuttals are back. Rebuttals are back. I am going to be coming for people's throats this week. I love when people uh, but I will <laughs> say not we. Talk, I will not talk over other people. Like I just did. I, I love when people say, uh, like they comment and say we, as if like his comment has the driving force of the people behind it. A lot of likes. If you get likes, though, if you get likes, it's you know, it's pragmatism. It's it, sad it, when it you works say out. We and you, and there's no likes. Yeah, that um, is tough. and I would also <laughs> like to point out that last week's title was not clickbait because I asked, "Is Kristen Tatar overrated?" And in the show, I asked, "Is Kristen Tatar overrated?" So <laughs> you know, I can I can just ask any question I want, and I can make the title very accurate accordingly. Um, okay, we're also joined today by Dylan. Dylan's first time. The show uh what's up everybody I want to say thanks for uh you guys let me come on the show i'm coming at you from nashville tennessee Ooh. i've been playing disc okay. golf for three years and the first weekend i started playing i started watching the pro tour and it was the las vegas challenge so i've followed disc golf closely since then and now i'm getting into uh some td stuff i've been co-tding for a few events now so it's been fun what's the best course in anybody's money true <laughs> It's a nonprofit disc and disciple stuff. So. <laughs> best best course in, in the Nashville area. What's the best course? Ooh. Uh you're gonna get so many people mad at me. No, that's the point. This. I'm yeah. gonna say uh seven oaks. Okay. Seven oaks. Yeah, safe answer. Classic. Uh we're also joined today by uh Brody with a Y. Mm. Perhaps the superior Brody. Mm. You took, you took my thunder, that's what I was gonna say. I was gonna say uh, I'm here to prove that Brody with a Y, uh is is always superior with an ie it is That's, i mean it is less letters um, i think, I think beat me, i have it's my fun. mom send you one of my trophies that i got as a kid <laughs> Because it has your name on it. You can just it mark like, off oh the, that's funny <laughs> you can just mark off the last name is that a common misspelling no one spells it ie yeah really interesting i don't know i mean i, I, get, people, I get people spell my name ie all the time interesting well that might be wow. my fault <laughs> <laughs> um and we're also joined by hunter with really good internet i don't know I'm, I'm getting wrecked i'm getting wrecked every week i wire in i do whatever i can apparently i'm coming through clean so i'm not you gonna are. touch anything yeah but everyone's in slow-mo um i'm getting destroyed by clickbait titles that i'm titling i'm not even on the show uh i just to be fair i walk in i say trevor what should i title it this week and uh, goes, oh, i don't know we do x ownership. y or z so I'm yeah. sorry, I didn't realize. Yeah, I didn't realize the definition of clickbait was you can't say things that were said in the video. These uh, days. Well, apparently, if you say something that makes people click, it is both good YouTube business and clickbait. So I yeah. don't know. I well, don't know. maybe yeah, so maybe it's call. a it really it was a it was a clickbait question. Uh, that the winner of the show will point. get one million dollars. Okay, See, now we're gonna title that. There you go. Now we're gonna title that. Eat a thousand hot dogs afterward. <laughs> so we'll just put <laughs> yeah, we'll add in the first part dot dot there dot, and that'll be the yeah. title. Um, all right, well, let's get into the actual show. Um, we're going to hop in with our first topic here. So the Disc Golf Pro Tour recently unveiled the first version of their new scores and stats platform. Uh, if you saw it, uh, you may not have seen it. I feel like it was a little bit hush-hush, but we kind of stumbled upon it. Uh, many, many are upset due to its lack of features, particularly in the stats department. So let's say you could add any track statistic to the new platform or change the way cur a current stat is kept. What would you change, Brody? I'm trying to find the, oh, here it is. So they, yeah, they released this thing and then said additional features, pages, stats, and analytics will become available in the coming months. That That's such an interesting strategy to like release something that like isn't done and then just basically say like, oh, but it will be done. Like, I don't know, just, just wait until it's actually done. But the actual statistics, 
Uh, this is a great question. I absolutely love this question because I am a statistician myself. I love the stats. The first one is fairways hit. We have to change this stat. We just played Brock Premier. Brock Premier has seven par fours, one par five. You can only hit the fairway nine times. That's it. Nine. Seven times off of the par fours and two times off the tee shot and the second shot on the par five. That's it. But do you know what the fairways hit we're out of? They were out of 19. You know why? Because they count them on par threes. They should not count as par. There is no fairway on a par three. You either throw it inside the circle or you don't. There's no fairway inside a par three. I think that's silly. The fact that someone can just jump putt 100 feet off the tee on a par three and it counts them as hitting the fairway. No, I hate that stat. Give me the ones of where people are throwing full shots on whether or not they're hitting the fairway or not. Now, these are unfeasible because we do have volunteers, but straddle putt, I would love to know if they're straddling, if it's an obstructed putt, something like that. And the last one is a forehand backhand distinction. If you could add that, that Mm -hmm. would also be a great stat. That would be an interesting one. Um, you are aware you just said out of 19 fairways. Am I missing something or was there 19 fairways? No, that there was nine. You could hit 19 fairways. That's my whole argument. You should only be able to hit nine fairways. They count currently. Was there 19 three. holes, Brody? No, there's a par five. So you can technically hit fairway oh. twice. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. I was, that's where I was confused. Wow. That Sorry. is, that is crazy. Sorry. That's crazy. So they, they do the par fives correctly where you can hit the fairway twice. They do the par fours correctly where you hit the fairway once, but right. then they do, they add the par threes of where you also hit a fairway. That's it, which I don't, I don't understand. Yeah. I kind of forgot that was a thing. Cause you never see a number like in golf. You never see a number greater than 18 or even remotely. Like usually it's like 14 or 13. Well, yeah. There's, yeah, there's like, yeah, four, four, that's, three. that's interesting to think about. Okay. Um, all right. Some good points there. Dylan, what do you think? Yeah. I also had no idea that this had came out over the weekend, so I did not get to see it in real time. I checked it out on Monday. So after the fact, and I mean, the stats were there for what you want to see as far as like, Hey, how, what did this person throw? How did this person putt? Um, I was going to say, where were the season stats? Where was like, hey, I hear that Paul Ulibarri is the best putter on tour right now. But I have nowhere to check that. I have nowhere to see that. If, if Evelina has really figured out the putt, well, how well is she doing all season long so far? So season stats were missing. That was weird. Did see that the throw tracker was on there. That's a big deal. It's a big feature that I loved on UDisc. So it's good to see that back. Hopefully that We'll get on the PDJ Live app if it's not already on there. Uh, forehand was the big thing I was thinking of because people say to be dominant now, you have to have that forehand. And so, well, let's see if that's really true. I think stats with that would be uh, really big. Also, patent pending. like Scrambling is, is a really weird stat. It's not really explained. Do I get they're off the fairway and did they save the par? But it's always been a broken stat. And uh, so I think that one needs to be fixed. But I do want to say something unpopular opinion here. I think this is a really big deal for the media. I mean, it's the average disc offer uh, that, you know, whether this is on an app or on a site, not that big of a deal. As in, I need the media to tell me these things. It's okay to be on a site, but on the app, I just need scores. I need whole breakdown and I need that throw tracker. That's pretty much all I need. Hey, fair enough. I mean, yeah, I mean, you're not wrong. The average consumer is not going to need some deep dive. And, and yeah. we definitely always have an interesting opinion as podcasters because we're just scrambling and, and digging for everything. But that's one way to look at it for sure. Um, I mean, they're needed right. for the story for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's important for the broadcast too. Um, all right, mm-hmm. Brody, Brody with a Y. What do you have to say? Okay, cool. Um, first of all, like when this first happened, I was I was kind of sad because I've, I've loved UDisc since I started playing disc golf. And just to like, see the kind of separation that has occurred between the PDGA, DGPT, and UDISC is like kind of frustrating. And so going into this, I kind of already have lower expectations, but I'm also willing to like allow it to happen enough to the point where like I respect like each company's ability to, you know, like quantify their own stats. And so I think that there are two really big ones that I think we're missing for um, like statistics. I think the main one or the two main ones are going to be that of like throwing velocity and distance on your average drives. And this is like drive specifically. I think that these stats do exist, but the frequency of them to be tracked on every single hole is not up to par to where I think it should be. And I think I can easily compare this to like baseball where you have stat cast where you have a home run is hit. All right. We see how far it is. What's the exit velocity. The reason those two are important is because those are kind of like the two biggest stats that the casual fan like Dylan talks about are it's easily quantifiable to them. And they're able to understand like, how, how important it is for those things to like actually 
actually occur. So I think a higher emphasis on that probably wins some people over in terms of like how they feel about um, DGPT and their statistics. Because I think regardless of, of like what DGPT will do, you're always going to have the naysayers that don't like the separation of um, like different companies and the, like the way they track things like UDISC versus DGPT and PDGA Live. So I think those two statistics will boost a, a appreciation for the statistic, but also like makes it more exciting to watch people throw drives like AB when he throws on 600 feet. Like, let me see that. That's actually a really good point because I, I don't really think about that too often, but a driving distance stat would be great because I think a lot of times we try to speculate which players are the furthest throwers on tour, and it's hard sometimes. Like if we had the numbers to really break that down, um, that would certainly be helpful. Um, all right, Hunter, what are your thoughts on the statistics platform? Yeah, I think uh, first off, first thing I'd like to see is uh, just give it back to UDISC, wipe your hand, say we tried and it's not working so far. Um, but if we're not going to do that, I think, look, Going last on this question is a little brutal, so I'm going to take it a little bit of a different angle because I think that a lot of people had some great points. Brody brought up one of having a, like, obstructed putt versus an open putt. Fantastic stat. The driving distance stat. The scramble stat has really bugged me ever since the beginning because you never know what the frick a scramble means. What I would have loved to see, and we actually talked about this at the beginning, that I'm very disappointed we haven't, is to rethink how are we taking stats. What I feel like they did is they took UDISC in its form Right. And then we're like, how do we try to recreate it? So everyone's just kind of happy. And then so far they failed. I mean, we still can't star a player. We still can't look at season long stats. We're seeing that Calvin Heinberg hadn't missed a putt from the round one at chess.com. How the heck am I supposed to see that and verify what the heck the pro tour is tweeting at us? And as a media company, how am I supposed to get these storylines to put stuff out? I would have loved to have seen them go the golf route, have like maybe you could see the map and you can see where people's drives are landing and that's tracking in. There's so many different routes they could have went, but instead they went, let's just try to get it to be like you disc under deliver, deliver it on PDGA live and then feel some pressure. So now we're just going to add different colors and put it on a new disc golf pro tour page and say it's our stat platform. So before we get to new stats, let's just fix the freaking thing first. Then we can worry about new stats. Uh, this was an utter fail in my opinion. Wow. Okay. Utter fail. Not even just a little one. Utter fail. Can I add, some, Milk it. Can I add some to Brody's point? Yeah. Um, so I think this actually, the distance wouldn't be that difficult to add because you would really just pick one hole. Because this past, this past week, there was only one hole the entire, uh, out of the whole course that we were actually throwing a full shot on. And that was hole eight, the par five. And so it would actually have been really cool to have someone with a range finder out there getting everyone's distances. And so like Brody said, when the leaders got there and AB ended up throwing it all the way to the trees, we could see, okay, AB just threw that 585 feet. The next guy is Garrett Gerthy at 570. And then Ezra threw at 550 and actually had that um, because you're not going to be able to do it on every hole because with disc golf, like very rarely do you actually have a hole that we're actually throwing far. Yeah, it definitely is more complex, but yeah, it would be cool to see that in, uh, cause every, anytime, really the only time you get that is like, sometimes whoever's on the ground will, will give you like an estimated distance, like what's have, about to happen on this upshot. And then you can guess, well, that got to pin high. So he must've thrown it, you know, 450 feet or whatever. I, I also don't trust most of these people. I mean, <laughs> I would say on average right now, there's one to two holes that the T sign is incorrect. Distance yeah. Oh wide. Yeah. The yeah. whole 18 was listed at 405 feet. The distance was actually 465. It wasn't yeah. even close. So I, I got to have someone with some sort of range finder in eye. I can't just be having someone on the ground being like, yeah, you threw that 715 feet. Yeah. Oh yeah. Cause that can be very misleading too. Cause I mean, you mentioned whole 18 being listed as 405 feet. If you see it, how hard even guys like AB were throwing hyzers into that hole. I mean, yes. they would have, they would have gone into the crowd if there was actually yes. 400 foot hole. Um, all right. Yeah. Interesting start for the stats platform. Hopefully they can move things along quickly or else people are going to get restless. That's for sure. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about, about a little bit about Gannon Burr and Anthony Barella, cause they have just had a stellar start to the season. Just really, really incredible. So right now we're seeing Gannon and Anthony dominate on tour. Both are undoubtedly popular players and fun to watch, but are they the best two for the job? So considering the perspectives of the tour, which would be more related to business. Um, and then also the perspectives of the fans more related to entertainment, which two players would be the most ideal to be dominating the tour in 2024 if you could take your pick so you can take any two players to kind of be in a spot where they dominate the tour all year who are the two players that you're taking 
Dylan. <clears throat> so first I want to say Gannon and AB are definitely up for the task. Okay. I mean, I was feeling it. I was watching Texas State's final round. I was like, these are the guys. This is it. Forget this whole, they're the future. They're the now. I was feeling it. I was so excited. I was like, I really need this story to continue on. I need these guys to continue dominating because it's really fun to watch. And here's the thing. AB especially, he has the likeness. A couple of weeks ago, I was helping run a C-tier on a Saturday, and I was shocked at how many AB jerseys, AB hats, AB bag, you know, stamps on it. It was just, I was surprised how many people were fans of AB. So he has the likeness. He's ready for it. But in the spirit of the question, I have to give you two people. Uh, first off, for the fans, somebody who can dominate, who's good at dominating, who has amazing arm talent, that's Eagle McMahon. But here's the thing. Eagle also has the personality. He has the media as well. He has YouTube. So he's the AB. He's got all the arm talent. He's, you know, he's got the disc golf fans in there. Now, if I'm being honest, uh, for business side, I need eyes. Okay. Who has the most eyes? Who has the most notable name outside of disc golf who would bring in eyes if they were dominating? And I'm not sucking up, but that's Sir Brody Smith. Okay. And he's got the notable. I mean, people have started playing no disc pressure. golf because he was playing it on his YouTube channel. It makes sense. So Eagle, Brody, if they're dominating. Just imagine. Hey, just imagine the views. I it would it would bring in a lot of attention. I like those picks. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. all right, Brody, swing it over to you. What would your two picks be? Cool. Uh, first of all, yeah, the choice on Brody Smith of like the most eyes is the most obvious. Love that choice. That's more of just like a good point, Dylan. Um, on Gannon and, and A B, um, I think that we've all had this universal experience. And when we go and tell someone that doesn't play disc golf that we play disc golf, you get kind of like a kind of a smile back. Like it's almost kind of funny to them or like doesn't really make much sense or doesn't seem that cool. It seems kind of like a kind of like a nerdy sport. And so for me, like if I want to point to someone who is cool that plays disc golf and who like does really good stuff, like it's it's gonna be A B hundred percent of the time. I think that any college disc golfer around my age and my demographic that plays um disc golf is gonna look up to this guy as someone that they just love watching. I, I love watching him throw. I think I think he is exciting and I, I think he is is someone that at his you know point in his career, he's finally starting to take off and he's finally got two wins this year, which I think everyone was pulling for and I think is really, really important. So like from a business side and from just like a entertainment side, the dude is like a good personality. He's got all the he's got the drip going on. Like he's just, you know, he makes disc golf look cool to a lot of people who don't understand like how cool it is to play disc golf, you know. And so I think he is is exists in that space, which is really strong. So I think he should be a part of these two I would choose to have dominate. On the other side, though, it's got to be Simon Lazat. He's been a staple in the game forever, and he is every year he does something crazier than the year before as far as a trick shot. Like I don't get how he does it. I don't think any of us do. And so I think that on a, from like a social media presence, just crazy shots that go viral, he's the guy you want to have to do it. You have AB who's really cool, and you got Simon Lazat who does stuff that makes you scratch your head because you have no clue how, how it happens. It makes the most sense. Hey, yeah, you're speaking my language. I mean, I definitely, um, I totally agree with with AB. Like, he was one of the first players that I saw when I was starting to play disc golf that kind of, like, yeah, he made disc golf look cool. I mean, there was a, an interesting cast of characters that were playing disc golf back when I started watching, and he just kind of looked like a normal kid. And I do think that when, if you were to show people different players, and I think a lot of players are starting to fit that bill a little more these days, but I think if you were to show people AB, it would be like, oh, it's just like a normal guy, like, I, that makes sense. So I definitely agree with that. Um, all right, Hunter, what's your pairing? Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm looking at this a completely different way. I think from, uh, the first two, well, maybe not completely different, but a little bit different. Um, I'm not really looking at outside of disc golf reach per se or anything like that. Gannon and AB, I think when it, what it comes down to is both of the guys are just kind of too likable. Um, where they just, I mean, AB is a little bit more polarizing of a vibe to them. But really, I think to push the sport forward, we need more eyeballs, okay? You need players that are going to get at each other. You need players who are willing to say what they're thinking in press conferences. You need, you need the Conor McGregor of the sport. So I have two Conor McGregors. I want Brody Smith and I want Nico LaCastro because both of these guys are going to speak their mind. They're going to stand up for what they believe in. They're going to stick to their guns. And I think it's going to create electricity where people are going to love them or they're going to hate them, but they're all going to watch them because you're going to want to see him fall or you're going to want to see him succeed. So give me Brody, give me Nico, not about anything outside of disc golf, just for the reasons that they got personalities. They're willing to say what they want to say. They don't care what people think about them. Um, and I think if they were dominant, gosh, it'd be electric. 
Oh, that's I mean, my the, the press conferences would be just remarkable. Just oh, watching yeah, that unfold. Good. Um, <laughs> yeah. well, you're focusing on disc golf now, so this is good. This is a good time for this. Well, I, yeah, I'm going to actually start practicing. So we'll, right, see. well, Brody, it seems um, like he may have stolen your, your pick there, but he kind of did. Yeah. Cause I'm going about the route. I, I, I love what Dylan and Brody are saying, but if you take a B, if you take Gannon and you put them up against another, uh, athlete in a different sport, those, those guys look like they're, they're, I'll say something nice. They look like they, they might be like the athletic managers. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, hmm. the guys that are like passing out the basketballs. So I'm with, I'm with Hunter here. I think, I think we have to embrace the difference that uh, disc golf has of where you don't have to be the stereotypical athlete in other sports to be good at disc golf. Uh, you don't have to be six foot five, 240 pounds, run a four or five, uh, be able to bench press two twenty. You don't have to do that. We've seen Eagle and Simon not be able to complete a push up. Um, it, it is something that we don't have to have in disc golf. And so I'm going, Nico Castro was one of my picks, but the other one I'm going is like, I want to also see someone that's like exciting to watch. And one of the guys that's the most exciting to watch when he's in the hunt is Greg Barsby. Oh, when he's throwing in from a hundred feet, he's charging, he's getting the crowd involved. I think we have too much of this idea that like, we need to be super stoic and like do this, like, I mean, I always make fun of Ezra because he does like this. He like does like the Phil Mickelson of where he's like touches his hat. We need a little more energy out there, folks. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I didn't see, I definitely did not see Greg Barsby getting picked there. <laughs> no. um, that surprised me a bit, but so, no. let's be honest. When he had that run at Worlds and when he, when he had that run of the piece, uh, when he won the uh, freaking yeah. ass. I mean, like, he, he's animated. Like he gets, he gets, he gets emotional. Going. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I see that. I, I like the picks. It's a, it's just a fun one to think about. Like in, in that scenario, in the scenario where you can have anybody, I mean, just, cause like, just think about it. Just think about Nico Castro again, being at the top of the sport. Like There's not a lot of people though. Oh my ever. gosh. I was going down the leaderboard. There's a lot of people that are just like, skip, 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 skip. And maybe I mean, that changes in the future, hey, but yeah. we've always said, we've always said we want more, uh, more loud personalities, but I don't know. Maybe they get shut down on Reddit too quick, and they, and they just <laughs> decided. Hey, Austin like, Hannum was fire. On exactly. For about exactly. Two weeks. He got he <laughs> got Hannum. smushed, man. They Never mushed. Forget. They mushed hot take Hannum. Is <laughs> unbelievable. Who will be the next hot take Hannum? Oh um, man. All right, moving on to our next topic here. So we are finally finally leaving Lone Star State. Uh, we are the, the tour is leaving Texas, uh, the Texas swing. So I want to know. You know, we've been there for a while now. The tour has just been kind of hovering in there. Uh, so who's your biggest winner and biggest loser from the Texas swing? This could be a player. This could be a company. Really, whatever you want it to be. Uh, biggest winner and biggest loser from this, it seems like, giant chunk of the tour that we've been on for a while now. Uh, Brody, what do you think? All right, we're going to have some deja vu here because I'm, I'm going with the same two guys and we'll have different orders for them. Um, first of all, I think that like, biggest winners and losers when it comes to tournament swings is always going to be on the players because that's who people care about the most when it comes to competitive disc golf. Um, and I think that one, our biggest winner is AB. I, I think winning, winning this past weekend was not only a thrilling finish, but something that he has now solidified himself as a top 10 player on tour and has, has allowed like, like everyone's been waiting for it, right? Everyone, everyone that knows has been waiting for him to kind of like burst through and finally figure it out. And that's what he's done. And that's kind of like what he is finally, you know, he wins chess.com and then comes and wins um, uh, like this past weekend. Like that's kind of like, all right, we've, we've seen it happen. I guess let's, let's keep it going. That kind of thing. And so for that, I think solidifies himself and solidification is really important in disc golf. And so I think when we talk about biggest winners, the person who solidified themselves the most, it's going to be AB on the flip side of that, the biggest loser, Simon Lazat. And I think we all love him, but at the same time, I think, I think he would admit this too, is that he is not playing to where he needs to be playing, especially within this, this past swing. We're talking 27th place, 76th place, and then 16th place at Austin, which is the closest he got in that three tournament span. Um, this is entirely unlike Simon. And I think we all know this as well. Um, I think some people will argue that age is starting to catch up to him. He's kind of on the back end of his more competitive career in terms of like being a competitive pro tour player, which is kind of scary considering that, you know, he just signed with MVP. And so obviously if you're looking at losers who want MVP to have a guy, they can, they can, you know, push through to the end. And, um, I think Simon Lozano being able to do that this past kind of few tournaments has, has hurt his stock a little bit. 
Yeah, it's been an interesting start for Simon. He's kind of been a sporadic guy in the past, but it definitely has been slower than people would anticipate. Um, all right, Hunter, biggest winner, biggest loser. I'm going the company route uh, instead okay. of the player route. So biggest winner, got to be Discmania. I mean, so let's just look at the Texas swing alone. You had Gannon take down Waco. You had Nick Loss taking down the open at Austin. Gannon's been in the top four all year, even if you extend it outside of Texas, but in Texas, all four all year. Uh, top four all year. Nicholas went second first to start. We aren't going to talk about this past weekend because it doesn't support my case. It wasn't pretty. But anyways, Kyle Klein finished all three in the top 10 as well. And you had Casey White sneak a top 10 in at Waco. You also had Alden Harris kind of flashing up and down. His finishes weren't stellar, but his performances were here and there. Um, so Discmania overall has just come out the gates absolutely swinging this year. Um, and especially in the Texas swing there and the biggest loser, I'm also going to stick with companies and I'm going to piggyback a little bit on what Brody said, which has got to be MVP because as much as they came out the gate swinging prior to the season, starting with the signing of Eagle, obviously they're keeping Simon on blah, blah, blah. They have zero top 10 finishes all year. They weren't, they aren't able to get one. So when week goes on week after week after week, they also aren't able to keep discs on the stock. I know that has nothing on the shelf, nothing to do with, uh, the Texas swing, but to start this year, we're talking more and more about this mania, less and less about MVP Eagles, kind of their, their shining moment because Simon's about to leave tour Eagles about to come back on tour. If Eagle comes out flat, we might not talk about MVP much this year at all, other than their sick disc drops, which is not really what you want when you're paying this much for players. It definitely has been an interesting stall in momentum for MVP. And you know, the thing is as powerful as their small team is you know the thing about having a small team you know two big players james conrad there i guess as a third you don't have a lot of options you know you can't just you can't be like team discraft where you're just rotating through okay who's going to be playing good at this time um this mania has kind of been that way with a three three guy punch right now as well but um yeah it's been an interesting start for for mvp for sure um all right brody what do you think biggest winner biggest loser I'll add real quick to what Hunter said with MVP. Paul Kranz was also a name that everyone was kind of yeah. hyping up before the season. Haven't, haven't seen much, uh, still early. And I know like starting kind of playing and being a professional and stuff is a little bit of a, it takes a little bit of time. So we'll see, but yes, this is another person that I think people were kind of hyping up on MVP. Uh, I'm going to agree with Brody with the biggest winner being a B I will say AB has been a top 10 player though for a while, Brody. It wasn't just like this year that he was a top 10 player. The big thing with AB was always, can he actually win? We saw multiple times where he put himself in position. He was playing the best uh, out of everyone in the field. And then when it came down to making the putts that need to be made or throwing the shot onto the Island that needed to be thrown, he couldn't do it. And I think doing it in Florida, everyone was like, oh, wow, he finally did it. But Ricky was kind of close. He missed that putt on 17. I don't know. And I think him solidifying this win, uh, you know, having Gannon Bird chasing him down, having that putt on 17 where old AB misses that putt. Old AB throws that putt on 17 straight into the cage and forces him half to birdie on 18. Uh, he makes the putt. He does what he has to do. Biggest loser, Ricky Wysocki. Got second at chess.com. Then a 10th place finish at Waco. Skips uh, skips the open at Austin and a tournament that he's won six times. He doesn't win. It's true. Yeah, <laughs> I know a lot of Ricky has been a little bit in the shadows so far this season, and a lot of people were expecting, I think Texas States to be like the okay, Ricky is here. Ricky is still around, and it fell very flat for him. It's looking a little scary for those guys in their thirties right now. It's looking a little scary. <laughs> hey, I, I believe it, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, not getting any younger. <laughs> All right, Dylan, wrap it up for us. Who's your biggest winner and biggest loser from Texas swing? All right, I got to disagree with the Brodies. Okay. okay. AB, it's expected. He's proven. We knew this was coming. People, Trevor got accused of talking about this for years, right? Uh, a couple weeks ago. So, Gannon, it's expected. Nick loss it was a matter of time. The biggest winner, it's a Cinderella story. It's Gavin Rathbine. All right. Florida Ooh. happened. Sixth place. Yeah, it was great, man. It's good to see Gant, you know, Gavin Rathbone back. He's got the mustache still going. This is awesome. But it was it a flash in the pan? No, because all right, Waco happened. Okay, it was bad. <laughs> but uh, open at Austin, got fifteenth. Uh, Texas State's dude got sixth. I mean, he's showing. Listen, not only do I belong on tour, but I'm one of your top guys. I'm one of your top guys. He's he's the winner. Uh, losers, I get it. I mean, Simon, you know, has been messing up. You know, he's he's he, but he's that's Simon Lazat. 
Okay, and he started to kind of come back a little bit, showed life last weekend. Uh, and listen, MVP, you might be talking about them saying they're the loser, but they're over there counting their money, not caring. Okay, I dude switched to putting with pickles, pixels. Sorry, not pickles. <laughs> that would be weird. <laughs> pixels, the moment they came out for no reason at all. The loser is wooded courses. Texas showed us wooded courses are a thing of the past. Open MCO, we switched from a wooded course where I could only see four holes while I was there. Now we're on this nice course where I, it's technical still, but I can see every hole. Wooded courses are the losers. Okay, I, I like those picks. Gavin Rathbone, that's a good one. That's out of the box. Go, but mini rebuttal. You can. Oh, Brody, you, you go first, though. That's fine. Okay. Dill, I wasn't sure if your disagreement was directed at me or the other Brody, well, um, but I think I think we both disagree with you here. Like what? Like what do they say about Calvin Heimberg before his first DGPT? He's good. He's a good player, but he, he, he doesn't have the big one yet. It's, it's the same thing. Same goes for AB. And so I think the idea that this was expected out of Anthony Brella at his young age is is far fetched. And I think it's the reason why it's important that he is the biggest winner is because he's finally gotten over that hump that Brody talks about, and I also talk about is like that that hump is finally we're over it, right? He did it once, and he's going to do it again. He's making putts that 2021 AB wouldn't have made. He's, he's doing things that, you know, he's, he's showing growth as a player and growth leads to success and success is why, you know, he's the biggest winner. That's like my biggest rebuttal there. I'll okay. just speak back to that. I think that for AB, it's a very similar course. Like I'll, I'll believe in him being like a top dog when I see him win at like Ledgestone or oh. Champions Cup. What's a similar like, course? On a wooded course? It, Florida, I get it. It was sort of wooded, but I mean. Oh yeah, also, those two courses aren't similar at all. Sorry, but Texas but, says, I mean, I didn't play yeah. them, but the looks, I, I mean, okay, that, tour guy. That's, that's what well, I'm just saying. It's not his fault, but I played both courses. They're not similar courses. Save it for your tour podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I just you have, have to a... jump in when I hear something. Yeah, oh. Hey, I respect it. You, you have a rebuttal. Was... We're in the, my yeah. mini rebuttal was this Gavin Rathbun, which uh, at this point in time, we've already interviewed him on tour life, but something I'm going to bring up is uh, he was six under through the first seven cameras show up. Easiest hole on the course, par five. He pars it. Then he clanks a birdie putt, pars it. Clanks another birdie putt, pars it. Then doubles a hole when the camera showed up. I mean, I wasn't saying he was the top tier player. No, no, I'm, I'm just saying, saying that is he's back. He brought he, himself he had, back from the dead a little bit. I, he, I will well, say no, that he but. ended up burning five of the last seven, but it was one of those where he was on this momentous round and then the cameras show up and it happens to everyone i i, I, mean, I, watch, I watch fpo and that happens every week oh so uh, i'm <laughs> it's the curse of the cameras i i mostly think yeah i think the gavin thing is curious because i think a lot you know when he first popped up everybody was kind of thinking he was next up and then he really disappeared there so i think it is impressive that he was able to kind of turn things around and get get back in the top 10 a couple times it is impressive i, I think that was an outside the box pick so i i, I do respect that um all right more on the last to topic here. Still very close. Uh, this is a fan submitted topic that I actually thought was uh, was pretty good. I wish I could see the scores. Um, <laughs> you definitely can see the scores, but you're two off the lead. You're one out of the finals right now. Very close. Uh, all right. So here's the question: Are organizations like the PDGA and Disc Golf Pro Tour making bad decisions with their current products due to an assumption of professional disc golf growing into a large global sport instead of planning for a more realistic growth cap of a niche professional sport like billiards or bowling? Do you think too many people assume that disc golf will someday be on par with leagues like the PGA Tour, or is that a valid goal? So decent bit to unpack here. I, I like this question. Shout out to the fan that submitted this. Um, I do read through them. Hunter, what do you think? Well, let's first off have a gut check here, okay? Disc golf, fantastic sport, a lot of fun, okay? We will never be a major sport, okay? By the time we're on the same level as the PGA Tour, they will be playing for billions of dollars while we're just now starting to play for millions of dollars. That's just how things are going to work, okay? So let's first off have that, but now let's take a look at the two on the hot seat here, the PDJ and the DGPT. I don't think they're making bad decisions for the same reason, although I do think they're both making bad decisions, so I'll go one at a time. The Disc Golf Pro Tour, I believe, is making poor decisions because I think they're under pressure to be profitable. Uh, if you remember when the Ra Todd Rainwater first bought out the Pro Tour, it was kind of announced that he was willing to fund it for a few years and they were going to be expected to be profitable. I believe we are in the time of it is now expected to be profitable. And so they're trying to milk as much money out of every aspect of the sport as possible for them in the short term instead of caring about long term growth. Um, so we're seeing them make a lot of questionable decisions there because they're just trying to 
get every penny out of people in the sport currently. And the PDGA, I think, is making poor decisions because I don't think they like for things to be out of their control. Um, so they're doing whatever necessary to keep stuff under their umbrella, even if it goes against what their true mission of serving the players should be or what you would actually think it to do. Um, so you put both of them together, and unless something changes, I think they're both susceptible to being overtaken in the coming years, but there's still plenty of time and opportunity for them to make adjustments because they have the power right now, um, and if they make an adjustment, they could still save it. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, I do think uh, it's very interesting. Not a lot of people talk about the whole um, the whole Disc Golf Pro Tour funding thing and them needing to become profitable eventually, but it, it might be sneaking up on them. It's tough to say. Uh, Brody, what are your thoughts? Hey, don't forget they own Jomez. Um, so I, I don't think you can say a goal isn't valid. Like if someone's like, I have this goal, I don't think you're allowed to say like, well, that's not a valid goal, but you can certainly tell them it's a dumb goal. Um, and so I would classify this as a dumb goal. Um, kind of like Hunter said, it, it's, it's, we're looking, when you're looking to the future, we should be trying to focus on like, how do we get more people at events? How do we get more people watching disc golf? Not how do we make more money from the people that are currently going to the events or currently watching disc golf? Um, it would be kind of the same vein as like us being like, Hey, you know what we should do instead of trying to get this podcast better to where more people want to watch it. And then we could actually maybe sell it to sponsors. Let's put this behind a paywall and charge everyone that is currently watching it money to watch it the growth behind a paywall is going to be so much harder. And now we're actually making our viewers pay us to watch our content versus our viewers consuming our content for free and sponsors, advertisers are paying for the eyeballs that we've created. Um, we got to try to figure out the, to create the least barrier of entry. I saw some of these prices, like the difference two years, what they were offering for tickets two years ago and what they're offering now. I mean, it's like, it's like uh, Taylor Swift's performing a after the show or something. I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> well, somebody's performing after the show, but it's not Taylor Swift. I'll tell you that for free. <laughs> <laughs> one <front> nine. <laughs> yeah, it's probably Kevin Wait, who Jones. who was that guy? No, who was the one guy that they paid to do a tour series? Of, uh, uh, Corey did... Wong or something. Well, yeah, Corey he like, Wong. Well, he, I think he ran it, but I think he only performed once. Like, I think it was just, he was like no, setting. No, I thought it was at three events. Did he, yeah, he, did, uh, he did a few. Was, he did multiple like, series. It might have been all well, the elite concert series i just don't know if he did every single one or if he was just i mean he was like an actual pro tour employee this is back when the pro tour is hiring <laughs> everybody under the sun um i'm surprised i didn't get a job maybe i did under a fake name <laughs> we'll never know trevor is Corey wong i yes i was Corey wong um all right dylan what are your thoughts i mean yeah listen pdga and disc golf pro tour they've made some bad decisions the the concert series thing is very annoying if it's if it's making tickets cost more it's pointless. Please stop. MCO, no one stays afterwards. They all leave. Uh, but overall, you can't blame them for trying. Listen, they're trying to grow, right? And if you're not trying to grow, you're going to die, okay? And as someone who's works at a place where I try to grow things and a lot of people complain, I mean, thank heavens at least there is effort. And it's not the PDGA saying, we're fine. We're good. We got it together. They're trying to grow. Thankful for that. Because listen, I would love it if when I talk to people out in the public, the disc golf had the same respect as billiards and bowling. Usually they're like, there's a pro tour for that. People get paid for that. Like they're shocked. Okay. I grew up watching bowling and billiards on ESPN. Okay. We were not at that level. We're not at that level. So yes, they need to, to try to grow. And of course they need to try to take things from the PGA uh, in moderation. I get it. But I mean, listen, they, they figured things out that the pro tour has not, the disc golf has not figured out. So yes, they need to copy them. They need to try to take things, from them uh because they need to grow we need that and listen this i feel like a lot of times these questions are coming from people who don't like seeing disc golf grow the whole slow the sport thing uh, i'm here to say one that's very selfish first of all guys okay disc golf if you love it you want to see it grow stop just caring so much about your social club and uh i'm done with that okay okay hey yeah i i, I have a rebuttal Go ahead. Is, is super... slow the sport just the disc golf country club mindset something to think about i like it mm. no whenever mm. someone has a positive thing to say about the pdga and doesn't actually say anything that the pga do has done positively <laughs> just says they're doing stuff that's good um no the nice pga is, is not trying to grow the sport 
They're trying to grow their pocketbooks. All right. That, that's they're trying to grow their pockets filled with money. They they keep sending out the magazine. How many people have to say that's the <laughs> stupidest thing ever? They're they're not changing. And if there is at all any sort of change, it's because they feel like, oh, we have to do something. And then they end up doing uh, something that's kind of stupid. So uh, okay. I don't think I, I could be wrong, Dylan. I don't think you actually said anything that the PGA has done that has been good. Uh, you just said they are trying. Dylan, to can you name stuff. anything the PDJ has done good? That's really tough, guys. Okay, How about this? If you can name, if you can name something, I'll give you a bonus point. If you can't name mm. something, I'll take away a point. Mm. What is something the PDJ has done good? Guys, they turned over the Pro Tour. They they dropped the NT. They accepted. They dropped the NT events. Hey, to that, the Pro Tour. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the bonus point because you did That's that on the it. spot. That was pretty impressive because yeah. that was a good thing they did. They. They did decide. I mean, it may have been the end of them if they didn't, but they they did hand it over. <laughs> they might have not had a choice. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of a hostage situation. But um, all right, uh, Brody, go ahead and wrap it up. For oh, us. I'm sorry. Did I? I thought that was the last. Yeah. One. Well, the comments will have their way. Yeah. Um, die, die, die. Anyways, yeah. the cool Brody, you may now speak. Apologies, bro. Oh. Okay. Perfect. Um, the the best the best word in this entire this is a great question. The best word in the question is the word assumption. Is this that they're doing all this with the assumption that it will catch up to a more niche sport that has for some reason a almost prime time market like ESPN showing bowling or billiards or those like that like among those kind of things. And so I think since the DGPT and PDGA are operating on an assumption that they grow within the next few years or whatever, then it's understandable why they're, like they're literally throwing the kitchen sink at like any way to grow. I say understandable does not mean I agree with it though. I think it's a I think it's a really bad form of of, of growth of an organization. And I think that like a lot of disc golfers that pay attention are going to be unified in this idea. I don't see very many people defending the DGPT, the PDGA, in their action to, to relatively grow the sport. I'm in heavy agreement with Brody on the idea that they're just doing this to line their pocketbooks. But I think ultimately, like if if we want to get on par with like what their actual goal is, what their actual assumption is, right? They're assuming this, this sport will continue to grow the way it did in those early COVID years, how quickly it boomed. Um, then I, I think, I think you got to sell, you got to start selling a lot of rights. You got to start selling a lot of rights. Like, like you need to like, like, you know, they make it like sell, sell your rights and then get it out there on a, a much larger platform, right? The, 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 the disc golf network, new streaming tiers has relatively failed we talked about it the first week i was on it's not something a lot of people like or they don't understand it and so for me i think the easiest way out of this easiest way to meet your assumption is is, is going to be to sell it like you got you got to sell the rights get this on a larger platform get more eyes on it and then you probably have a better chance of like making people happy with things like statistics and, and those kind of things and you can broaden your base you can broaden your ability to do that mr smith good one I agree. Hey, whenever <laughs> someone's attacking the PDGA, pit for, pitchforks, pitchforks. Why are we paying a million dollars for ratings? Pitchforks. What do you mean? It's a proprietary algorithm, and we would be we would be broken without it. I just got paid a hundred dollars to say that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't you don't know you don't like the algorithm? Here's the thing: I don't know what my scores are, but I'm probably not making it to the finals, and that's a good thing because I not did true. not want to answer that question. You're currently tied with Hunter, and I was going to give you an option to advance. Can't you see the light green? 14 to 16. Hey, he's not tied oh, with no, me. you're not tied with Hunter. I thought I Hunter say, had what are you talking about? Exactly. I'm I not can't see like the scores. Exactly. I swear, no one can see the scores. I swear, I looked down a second ago, and I saw you. I was like, I know I'm delayed, the but how did I lose two points? <laughs> Listen, in my brain, I thought I knew Hunter was in the lead, and then I looked down, and I thought I saw a 14. <laughs> And I was like, oh, Hunter's not in the lead. Like, you I'm just like made my heart drop. I was like, I saw my score. Dang, I, was, I had what, a fire tiebreaker. I was gonna see who could points? I was gonna see who could spell Evelina Solonen's name too. <laughs> <laughs> Can you do it, Brody? E V E L I N A S O L E E N. A no. two eyes. Hunter, can you spell it? I'm in the lead. No. <laughs> there is two eyes. You're right about that part. But no, I respect I respect the confidence in which Brody just attacked that. Uh, all right, yeah, we're going to move on to our finals. Dylan and Hunter. Hunter was in the lead. Don't need to get my eyes checked. Um, that you guys are moving on to our final question. So I haven't done one of these in a while. I used to write these questions a lot. But uh, the way we're doing this is you're going to treat each player I'm going to list as a stock you're investing in. Okay, you got to buy one, sell one, and hold one. So would you buy, sell, or hold these players? Kevin Jones, Drew Gibson, James Conrad. Which one are you going to buy? Which one are you going to sell? And which one are you going to hold? Hunter, would you like to go first or second? Give me first. All right, take it away. 
Uh, first off, great selection of players here because this was tough. Because uh, honestly, if I didn't have to buy and hold one, I would sell, sell, sell. Uh, <laughs> but hey, that's not the game, and I'm here to play the game. So I'm going to sell Kevin Jones. I'm going to buy Drew Gibson. And I'm going to hold James Conrad. Let me explain my reasoning here. So Kevin Jones, in my opinion, has been one of the biggest disappointments in professional disc golf. Um, he had wow. extremely high expectations. He had extremely high athleticism. And yet we don't really have the results expected to match. I mean, he was a flash in the pan at USDGC a few times. And I, I mean, I, it's just, I expected him to be consistent at a high performing level, top 10 guy week in and week out. You got to scroll 10 times to find his name most weeks instead. James Conrad uh, has his fans and he's going to make his noise here and there, but um, really isn't going to do a ton to move the needle. Conrad fans will support him no matter what. Uh, his game fits some courses, so he'll, you know, make some noise at those. Uh, so that's why he's a hold because, you know, he'll do his thing. He'll get his when time comes, but you'll kind of forget about him most of the week. Drew Gibson's a buy simply because of, um, of these three, he has the biggest media presence outside of the course, and he has finish line discs to go alongside it. So if you're investing him as an actual company, you don't actually have to worry about his on-course performance, which again, with these three, I think they're kind of all neck and neck. So I feel like that's kind of what separates him here. Um, Cause with finish line, that seems to be doing pretty good across the board. And then he does have a YouTube. Now what the heck Hugh Frisbane is? I don't know, but Hey, some people <laughs> like it and he's got a, at least he's trying. I don't really see Kevin Jones and James Conrad putting out much media. So I got to go with by Drew Gibson solely for the outside of the course reasoning so buy drew okay. sell kevin hold james like a baby okay okay i like it how many drew gibsons are you buying uh five just five drew gibsons that's okay. all i can afford right now okay fair enough um all right dylan buy sell or hold who are you going with all right so i'm gonna buy james conrad i'm gonna hold drew gibson and i'm gonna sell kevin jones i'm gonna sell kevin jones because kevin i hope you're watching I love oh. you. Okay. You're such so fun to watch, but you used to be. Now it's sad. You look like you don't enjoy the sport anymore. And I'm worried about you. All right. Like, is the dude like gonna retire after his contract up is with Prodigy? I don't know. It's just it's like watching somebody kick your dog. Okay. It's just it's not <laughs> it's just rough. It's rough out there. He used to laugh and giggle at, at the skins matches. Where'd you go? Kevin, I, I can't watch anymore. I need to sell you. I need to get you out of my sight. Holding Drew because I have no idea what's going on with this guy. All right. What is where his performance lately? He wins an A tier out of nowhere, but then proceeds to play much worse at every Pro Tour event. And uh, he's yeah, that's his whole career, though. He pops up. He won Las Vegas. Okay. Uh, this is all I know. He won Las Vegas. And after that, it's just he's nowhere. And he also gets a little his hot takes sometimes or things he says, uh, explaining, you know, the defending Simon and the YouTube videos. It, it can turn some people off. But I believe there could be a future, so I'm going to hold it. I'm going to hold it. Here's the thing. I'm buying James Conrad, okay? I get it. Has he played well? Probably not in two years, okay? To be honest. Uh, but he has the legend. Okay, He has the shot. I can I can not think of James Conrad all year long. You play that video, and I'm just, I am bursting with emotion, okay? That shot is amazing. He's always going to have that. You can't take it from him. And if no one else on this list is going to give me anything, well, at least give me the holy shot, okay? So I'm gonna go James Conrad to buy there. Hey, James Conrad's a likable guy. You know, yeah. you gotta love him. I I can already see the the title of this episode actually, and it's Kevin Jones is sadder than your dead dog. <laughs> That's gonna be the title. <laughs> Kevin Jones, man, I did not I did not write that question to get him thrown under the bus like that. But he, man, he just got run through it. That was that was tough for Kevin Jones. But hey, you're right. I mean, he was he was supposed to be amazing, and and it just never really happened. Um, but in any case. Hunter Thomas is our winner today. 25 to 23 final score. Well done, Mr. Hunter, with the better internet. Very well done. Um, what do you have to say about your win and your internet situation? I'm just glad I was able to come through. Uh, I've been, you know, literally carrying this company on my back today. Uh, Trevor and I both just carrying desk after desk after desk. I'm physically exhausted. I'm mentally exhausted. Um, and looking at these questions, I think I developed dyslexia today. None of them were making sense to me, but I luckily went last so I could just hear everyone else and then formulate arguments based on that. Um, so I'm glad to be here. Uh, happy to be back on top and ready to go to sleep. That's right. That's how I write questions, baby, <laughs> to put you in a twister. Um, 
In any case, uh, we'll be back next week with another episode. If you would like to submit some topics that could be featured on the next episode, because that second to last question, the final question of the first round, was submitted uh, by uh, one of our fans, you can scan the QR code here on the screen, or you can also click in the, the link in the description below, and that is where you can write in your questions. Get as creative with them as you want. Uh, try to make them very divisive, and maybe they will get added onto the show. Always love having suggestions. Other than that, we'll see you next week. Top comment, ne top comment on this video. I will do next episode. That was a terrible That's idea. Dangerous. But hold I don't on know to what that. You're thinking there. <laughs> I might be the top comment on the next video. Um, we'll see you next week. <laughs>